Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today is a best-selling author and a quirky wilderness woman who is deeply connected with nature. She comes from a long family lineage of cunning folk and was brought up a spirit keeper in the old magical traditions of Britain. She trained as a transpersonal psychotherapist and was thrilled to discover how the transpersonal perspective meshed with the old magical ways she'd been brought up in. She initially opened a practice in London, but was always more at home in the wilderness. So she and her husband moved to the Welch marches. Her bragging rights include dancing for Arlene Phillips, taking a contemporary dance class with Robert Cohen flying in a Jaguar fighter aircraft, and being kissed by Mick Jagger. She loves cats and eats paleo, and her tagline is, if the cat and the boyfriend disagree, get rid of the boyfriend. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Ellen Sintier. It's lovely to be here, and I'm really thrilled to be on your program. And I was so delighted that you asked me. It's so good. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. We're so excited to have another international visitor with us today. Yep, indeed. Yeah. Alan, our opening question on Authors Over 50 is always, so what took you so long to write your first book? Going to work. And I expect that runs for most of us. Um, writing is not an easy profession to actually live off and so you need usually to have something else and particularly at the beginning and when you're starting out you know in your 20s and your 30s you want to do things you want to go on holiday you know you want to have a life and that requires some money so I went to work but working eight hours a day doesn't leave you very much time for writing although I did start um Usually when I was on holiday, and I don't know whether other people do that, they probably do, but, you know, there you are, you've got your space and you're, it's all warm and comfortable and nice. And so you start writing and then you go back and then you go back home and then you end up back at work and it's like, ah, uh, gone on the shelf. So I had to wait. And in some ways, I suppose I was very lucky I got medically retired. I I got very, very sick. And I got medically retired from my um, software engineer job. And that opened up everything. It opened up all the space to write. And, of course, because I was sick and I was on a a sick income, I had got enough to keep me alive. But not all of us are lucky like that. (laughs) Well, sometimes good things do come from bad. They do. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ellen, you've been quite prolific since that first book. I think you've got 12 books out now. That's right. Yeah. Well, once you wrote that first book, how did you proceed? Did you search for an agent, decide to choose a hybrid, a small press, or did you self-publish? Well, I hunted around for an agent at first, but we're going back to 1999 um, and a little bit before, really. It was very difficult then. It is a lot easier now to get in touch with agents and publishers and everybody's using the internet and we're all Zooming and talking to each other. In those days, you had to write a physical paper letter 
and post it and then wait, wait, wait to see if anything happened. And I'm an impatient person a lot of the time. And I thought, oh, no, I just want this out there. And uh, probably lots of authors feel that. It's your baby. You want it out there. And so I found an American publish self-publishing firm, Lulu, and thought, okay, I can do this. <laughs> Not realizing what I'd taken on, um, but I did. So I ended up self-publishing, having not intended to start there. Well, you must have gotten very good at it if you have written 12 books. Oh, the writing is the easy bit, Julie. It's the publishing that is not easy. And it's the final editing, of course, because if you're the writer, you're the author, and I'm sure you know this, you know what you put on the page. You know what it actually says, so you don't read it. So you don't say, read that you got the mat sat on the cat. Uh, you think you said the cat sat on the mat. And so you need somebody else to come in there and say, no, 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 no. You didn't get that right. And to correct it for you. I got a friend who was a proofreader, she still is, and she helped me. Uh, thank the gods, because it would have been a mess <laughs> otherwise. Um, and then there's all the stuff about how do you do a book cover? And, you know, how do you get it together? And how do you organize the words on the page? Uh, it's a lot easier now Amazon have got their stuff together. That quite takes you through it. But in those days, no, you had to do the whole jolly boiling yourself. And it's quite hard work. Well, I'm sure. And I'm, I'm sure that there's quite a learning curve to learn how to do all of that. <laughs> About like that. <laughs> well, I, I, I've only written two books, so I want to know how do you come up with the inspiration for each of these 12 books? Um, I've got four more sitting in the back of my head now. <laughs> and they're sort of scrabbling at the one that I'm very nearly finished and you have to keep pushing them back because I don't know if you've ever tried to write two books at once but it, it schizophrenic isn't in it it's it's just silly so you you've got to keep to one and stick with that and finish it but I just have all these ideas come I'm I don't know I, th I call it the ideas fairy I've got the ideas fairy and she comes and visits me and says, help me write about that how about you write about that? And can you go away a minute? I haven't finished writing about this. <laughs> I've so, always heard of people writing more than one book at a time, but I just can't imagine that I would ever be able to keep the the timelines or the characters straight. The only time it works for me, and I've done it, I have done it twice, was when I'm writing a fiction and a nonfiction, because you don't have characters in the same way in the nonfiction, and it's very much more plotted and you have a, you know, here, 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 here. Whereas in fiction, you can sort of get so far and you think, actually, it'd be much better if we did that before we did that. And so that requires quite a lot of effort. And I have done it twice because um, I'm now published by a big firm as well. And they, my editor, he's a darling, but he sort of says, oh, and I want this now. That yesterday would have been fine. Uh, no, Trevor, all right then. And so you have to sort of get your nose back on the grindstone and, and do it. He's at me at the moment, but I've told him he can't see me until next year. So, so. <laughs> do you have a specific writing routine? Are you a morning person or a night person? Do you write every day? I write every day, um, unless the uh, money making job. I'm a I'm a psychotherapist and life coach as well, and if I've got too many clients, then you know I have to just stop and uh, watch a film or read something completely different to get them out of my head. But I try and write every day, and I write in the morning and again in the evening. But I don't write during the day. Not really, occasionally a note or something, but I'm usually wanting to do something else during the day. 
Well, what about publicity? You know, we writers want to write. We don't want to promote ourselves. Have you found any methods that work or that maybe didn't work? Um, the ones that don't work are when you don't understand what publicity is. When you're looking at it from your perspective as the writer, which is, of course, where you are, and you're not seeing what's going to catch the public. And finding that out is really hard work. Um, once I got in with John Hunt, I didn't have to do very much of it. They did quite a bit of it, but they're not so good. They, they publish nonfiction mostly, although they have published a, a fiction book of mine. And so for the fiction, it's really hard work. And what I've found now, um, I'm a member of LinkedIn, and I found I've got two or three people got who are contacts I've got to know who know how to do publicity. And a couple of them are writers. So they know it from that side as well. And they are bliss because I sit there, what do I do now? <laughs> Look helpless. <laughs> and then they say, buck up and get on with doing this, uh, which is really nice. But they're much more helpful um, than I'd ever had directly from publicists from the firm or anything like that they seem a bit a bit stick in the mud then put it that way but they're, they're great people but they don't they can't get the spark of you know you want to, you want it to come over like disney and um you've got to have spark to do that and i'm now finding people who have the spark and are getting me to do things that I should do, but it's so hard. So they're advising you how to do it. They're not doing it for you. Um, yes, I don't make enough money to outsource it completely. And I'm also a little bit nervous about, it's a bit like, you know, fingers crossed and hoping um, somebody will take one of the books for a film. And the other part of me sort of says, no, no, I can just see what they're going to do with it. <laughs> so it's difficult because you've got their perspective and yours. So finding someone who you really blend with, meld with, feel friendly with as your publicist is, I feel it's important and I've just found one now who I think will be really useful. In fact, two. So, but it's so hard to find them. Yeah, it really is. And, and it is difficult to turn over our babies to other people and expect them to treat them with the same respect that we have. So I, I understand what you're saying. I, I've heard that Hollywood will take an idea, not even read your book, but take your idea and turn it into whatever they want. So that's what we often hear people say, the book was so much better. Well, it was better because nobody <laughs> has read it to turn it into film. <laughs> yeah, I, I've noticed that too. And it's sort of worrying because you read a book and you think, um, I'm sort of going back a long time now. I first read Stephen King's The Shining, and it sort of scared the hell out of me. And it was brilliant. And I was there glued to it, despite being going, ah, I'm not turning the light off. Um, and then the film came, and Jack Nicholson is brilliant. He's got it. But they come along and they do a bit, and I go, but that doesn't happen, because you know the book. And... I don't know. A lot of people like it. And I, I still don't dislike the film, but I wish they'd stuck with the, what the author wrote. <laughs> Very true. Well, tell us a little bit about the book that you're going to share with us today and then read um, a section so that we can hear your tone and voice in it. Well, this is the first book. I'll wave it at you. Um, Let's get away. You can get away there. Um, Owl Woman. Uh, this is, I told you about doing cover and things like this. So I've got an artist friend who I got to actually do the picture. 
but doing the rest of it was sort of like me and like how do you do this so that it actually works and I tell you one thing that's really awful is you've got to get this right because that's the bit that sticks out on the bookshelf and I got that wrong so many times <laughs> so it was quite fun but Our Woman is I said it's the first book I wrote it's a very personal story to me because it's developed from the legend I grew up in a little village on the edge of Exmoor which is down in the bottom left hand corner of, of Britain um, the bit that looks like a toe of a boot and um, it's lovely down there but it is very wild it's gorgeous We've got lots and lots of stories and legends, and the legend of this village goes back at least 4,000 years because I checked that in the British Library. I went around checking up things, what we've got. And it's about a well uh, which has sacred water. The village had, until about two, 300 years ago, used to make an enormous income out of pilgrimages from people coming to drink and wash themselves in this water um sort of like in 1400 and spelling mistake they were getting 60 pounds a year now that was like hundreds of thousands nowadays uh, so it was really really famous and it's a wicked stepmother legend that um there's a father the daughter and the mother dies and he goes and gets off with this other woman and she wants to take over from the daughter. And the daughter is like the guardian of this sacred well. And so the stepmother does all sorts of nasty things and bad mouths her and eventually gets the men of the village to kill her. And when that happens, then a new spring uh, comes up where her blood falls, which is fairly standard story around the world. But this one was very personal because it was the village that I lived in. And the well was actually built into the wall of our garden. And it was looked after my uh, by my aunt. So it was like, this is mine. You know, this is about what I need to write. And so I took the story and took it all up to... It's set in about 1999, 2000. Took it all up to date and used all the magic that I grew up with for the heroine and the hero and the, the bad woman um, to work the story out and to make a mess of and to get in trouble with and then manage to get out of trouble. And eventually they do win um, with fairly gory battle nearly at the end so it's an adventure story it's a mystery and it's very personal vicky wrestled silently with her invisible captor she knew it was a dream one of those terrible ones where you are out of control no way out but there's nothing she could do fear cold and palpable gripped her and she couldn't move then suddenly she was free, flying over the treetops, darkness rushing beneath her, moonlight blinding her. And then it all came into focus, and she found herself hovering above the tower as a barn owl. A man stood below her on the edge of the waterfall, something golden in his hands. He held it up to the light, and now she could see it was the cup. No, no, he mustn't do that. She tried to call out to him, tell him, but only the screech of the owl came out. He ducked, startled, let go the cup and fell. She watched him plummet down the 50-foot waterfall and hit the pool like solid concrete. His body plunged through and carried on down to the bottom where he smashed his head open on the rocks. And then slowly he floated up to the surface again, pinwheeling, like one of Van Gogh's crazy stars. She hovered over him, unable to cry, unable to speak, and something bright glimmered in the water near him. He turned towards it, his finger pointing. It was the cup, 
How the hell was it floating? She strained to speak to him, but it was no good. His eyes caught hers. He could see her. Somehow he wasn't dead yet. He tried to turn to reach for the cup, but just as his fingers touched it, it slipped away from him and sank down into the water. He looked at Vicky desperately, his lips moving. Remember, he said soundlessly. Remember. Beautiful, beautiful. You have such beautiful descriptions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do you read for pleasure? And if so, what genres do you read? Oh, um, good, very good and old sci-fi. Um, Ursula Le Guin, Roger Zelazny, George R. R. Martin, that kind of stuff. And then good detective mystery stories. But I don't like the procedural ones. I want the ones where you're in the story and everything goes wrong and then it seems to go right and then it goes wrong again. And the characters are all three-dimensional. That's quite important. And something I find a little difficult to find in, in some genres now, people tend to do sort of cardboard characters that don't have enough background and they're, the villain hasn't got any good bits and for me you've got your your villain's got to be believable he's got to have some redeeming points um otherwise they become two-dimensional again so it's adventure mystery science fiction or fantasy science fantasy is good so yeah well you write you must write so quickly how how long on average does it take you to write a book with all these ideas crammed into your brain? Uh, too long as far as the ideas fairy goes, but uh, she'll just have to go and sit down and have a cup of tea. Um, if it's nonfiction, it takes about a year because you've got to get it together. And when you've written, I'm, I'm sure you know this too, you need to put it aside and let your brain get over it for a month or maybe two months and then read it again. And then you come at it fresh and it's much more, much easier to get a, a real good handle on it, make it flow better. But with fiction, um, two years, maybe three, uh, because there's so much research to do. There is so much backstory to write. I think, Maybe I'm sure the audience who's authors, who are authors here will understand that you can't write a character without writing at least a short novella of backstory about them. You know, you've got to know what happened when they went to school and how they tripped over and broke their nose and got in a fight and, you know, and did all this, all the ordinary, normal stuff that won't come into the book, but it will flesh out who you're talking about. And so you've got a lot, a lot, a lot of that to do with fiction. And then there's research. I can't really write about a place that I don't know well. Fortunately, I've done quite a lot of traveling. So I've got places, you know, in my bones that I've been to and love. But even so, you have to go like, do you go down that road or this road to get there? And uh, one of them in Owl Woman, there's a, a, an important bit about stepping stones across this stream, which are really there and they, they exist. They're one of my favorite places. And I could not remember whether it was seven stones or nine stones. It's actually seven. And I had to actually go back for a weekend holiday there to go and check because it was, it's not in any book. <laughs> how many stones was that and asking my husband who's like why what who i don't know <laughs> and um it has all that to do then there's i love archaeology there's archaeology and a bit of archaeology in all of the books um including our woman and some and some of it's real as well and so you have to go and check up when was that found 
where is it now? What has happened? So there is a mass, a mass of research to do. You know, I don't have that with the nonfiction because I'm writing about what I know and live every day. And so that needs ordinary editing tidying up, but very little research in comparison. So. Well, you're so, so, so wise, Ellen. And I love your, your expression. I've got places in my bones you know, I, I love that because I think everywhere we do travel or everywhere we live, you know, I think it seeps into us and yes. and becomes a memory that that comes out when we're writing. Yeah. And sometimes it'll come out just, you know, the scent of some food that you ate there comes back. And you go, oh, oh, you know, I, I'm back on Crete or something yeah. um, there or the scent of a tree or flowers or even traffic. Uh, I've had that sort of a crossover between London traffic and suddenly remembering traffic in Paris, which is different. Or well, I mean, the petrol smell is fairly the same, but it is different. And you say, oh, I'm back there again. I think authors I travel. <laughs> yeah. I, I think they say that a scent will bring back a memory faster than any of our other senses. Yeah. 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 They do say that. And I think it's true. It certainly is for me. What are you working on right now? Huh, the third novel. <laughs> um, it's magic mystery romance again. So we have a, uh, heroine and a hero i'm not actually i'm nearly at the end of it i'm just on the like final polish and a, a couple of bit of backstop stuff to go in i'm not actually sure whether the protagonist is the heroine or the hero they're very equal uh, which is something i've not done before and it's coming out very interestingly i've got a mentor I write with a um, woman who works for Faber and she's okay with me with this. She says, I'm, I've got a handle on it, but it is different. And it's um, very dark. The villain, the bad guy, the antagonist is the girl's, the heroine's great grandfather who is a thoroughly nasty piece of work. <clears throat> I'm just finding him a couple more good bits because otherwise he was getting two dimensional. He's a, a sorcerer, he's a nasty man, he's selfish, he's controlling, he's narcissistic, and he gaslights her. And he also is um, something of a sexual vampire. So, you know, he's a lovely guy. <laughs> he sounds lovely. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And yet he's got to have something that's going to attract you. Otherwise, you won't go with him. Yeah. And the only she he's messing up her life, but he's also messing up the land of the village where they she lived. She now lives in London, but she comes from this village on Exmoor. And he's messing it up. He's um, messing with the incoming people who are there. He's messing with the land itself. And he needs to be stopped. And his sexual vampirism has enabled him to get to being 98 and being as lithe and spry as a man of 60. So, which I have actually seen in someone a good many years back unpleasant and they have to stop him the heroine and her lover the hero and in order to do that they have to learn sex magic so it's spicy <laughs> <laughs> sounds fascinating <laughs> and there's it's not just it's not just sex though it's it's their love their worries they the fact that they fight each other because they make misunderstandings as everybody does when they have a love affair and they get everything around the back of their neck and then beat each, beat each other up at least verbally and run away and come back together so there's lots of character building and about the characters themselves 
And as per uh, Campbell's hero's journey thing, they have mentors who are in the background saying, stop being such a bloody fool and do this right. And, oh, all right then. And so they've got helpers in the background as well as friends and themselves and things that happen. So um, that's going out looking for someone, me or a big publisher, which I would like. Tour, bu tour books, please. Tour books would be great. <laughs> um next year so fingers crossed and you can all read that well you've led such a fascinating life i mentioned some of those in the bio at the at the top of the the podcast including kissing mick jagger now you might want to tell us more about that or you might want to tell us something that your readers don't know about you um well, we can start in with Mick. Um, this was before he actually became famous. I had, my dad had friends in London. So we used to go up to London from Devon uh, quite often. And the friends had children and I was about 14 and I had a boyfriend up there who was 18. And we used to go out to clubs and dancing and that sort of thing and the stones used to play at the station hotel in richmond and we used to go and my boyfriend knew him and he knew he knew um, charlie watts as well the drummer and so oh hi guys hi guys you know and um, so you know mick just scooped me up and that was that <laughs> and at 14 it's like wow <laughs> What did your boyfriend have to say about that? Oh, nothing, <laughs> nothing at all. Um, it, it was fine. He, he's, he was a very good bloke, actually. He knew when he was being teased. He knew when he was being attacked, and he could tell the difference. And he knew that Mick was just winding everybody up, yeah. including me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great, great memory. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, Ellen, as always, our last interview question is our writers over 50 are a unique set. Do you have advice for writers 50 and above? Believe in yourself. Be yourself. There's nothing else that sells. There's nothing else that works in a book, in anything that you do. Be you. There will be people out there who love it. There'll be people out there who don't like your stuff as well. That's fine. Nobody likes everybody. Um, but be yourself. Believe in yourself. And, yeah, a couple of things really on the total writer thing is the maxim, show, don't tell, is write always. Do not tell people about what's happened get them there like they were in a film watching it happen and feeling it viscerally themselves. And the other one is kill your darlings. When you find that you've got this gorgeous scene, it's absolutely stunning and gorgeous words, everything's absolutely beautiful thing. I don't think that's going to spin. And be prepared to go out because really we all fall in love with something and then if you show it to you know you've got good friends who will give you proper criticism and not go oh darling that's so lovely which is about as much use as nothing um they'll say ellen that's really wishy-washy don't do that and you go, mm -hmm. and you go yeah get over it darling <laughs> so really believe in yourself show don't tell and be prepared to kill your darlings. Well, you are a wise woman, and I think that's great advice today. And we appreciate you so much for your time from across the, the big pond and, and zooming in here with us today. And we are now excited to say you're one of our authors over 50. Thank you. 
Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like daily newspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.